Hi again, Ken Scott Latourette, A History of Christianity, in Chapter 11, the Byzantine continuation. He is tracing the transfer of Christian civilization to the East. After the fall of the Roman Empire in the West, Constantinople became the most important city to Christianity for some centuries. This is page 281 of A History of Christianity. Eventually, after many discussions among the bishops and with Justinian, that is the emperor, the latter called a synod of the entire Catholic Church, usually known as the Fifth Ecumenical Council. This met in Constantinople in 553. Vigilius, that is Pope Vigilius of Rome, refused to attend and insisted on giving an independent judgment on the points at issue. The gathering confirmed the condemnations of the imperial decree of 544, and at the command of the emperor, probably had the name of Vigilius as an individual struck from the diptychs, but without breaking off communion with Rome. The emperor banished Vigilius, but the latter was freed when he had conceded the legitimacy of the council. This Vigilius did, con condemning the three chapters and their defenders. Thus the Cyrillic interpretation of the Council of Chalcedon, with its leaning towards mono Physitism was made official for the Catholic Church. Now, monophysitism or physitism is the teaching that Christ has only one nature, the divine nature, instead of the Chalcedon interpretation, which had been that Christ has two natures, both divine and human. Yet the Fifth Ecumenical Council did not, as Justinian had hoped, restore unity in the Church. In spite of its endorsement by Vigilius and his successor, numbers of the bishops in Italy and Gaul refused to recognize it as authoritative, and for more than a century part of the West was divided from the main body of the Catholic Church. Moreover, Justinian's dream of providing a via media, or a way in the middle, which would win back the monophysites, was by no means entirely fulfilled. The more extreme among the latter believed that assent would mean compromise of jealously held convictions. In some areas, notably Egypt, Ethiopia, Syria, and Armenia, monophysite views were becoming identified with a regionalism, which, to use a 19th and 20th century term, was a kind of nationalism. It resented control by the Greeks and from Constantinople. What Justinian was unable to accomplish by negotiation, persuasion, and a council of all the church, he endeavored to bring about by force. He wished an empire which would be solidly Christian and orthodox. He sought to extirpate what survived of paganism. In its formal cults, paganism was clearly dying. Yet many continued to be pagans at heart and held to the pre-Christian Greek philosophies. To rid the realm of these remnants, Justinian enacted fresh legislation. He commanded both civil officials and bishops to seek out pagan superstitions and forbade any persons infected with the madness of the unholy Hellenes, that's Greeks, to teach any subject. There were prosecutions and confiscations of property, and as we have seen, Justinian closed the schools of philosophy in Athens. Yet many among them, some in high office remained pagans and usually were not molested if they were not ostentatious in their faith. Justinian also placed the Samaritans under heavy disabilities and ruthlessly suppressed the revolt which his measures provoked. He was somewhat more lenient toward the Jews, but essayed to regulate their worship. He decreed the death penalty for Manichaeans and for heretics who, after recanting, fell back into their former beliefs. He tried to argue with Manichaeans, and when he failed to convert them, had numbers of them killed, among them nobles and senators. He took vigorous measures against heretics and was especially zealous against the Montanists, who after nearly four centuries still persisted in Phrygia, the region of their origin. He took action against some who, professing to follow Origen, used the name of that famous teacher to justify a pantheistic mysticism, which was enjoying something of a vogue especially in Palestinian monasteries. He labeled Origen as a heretic, and either the Fifth Ecumenical Council or an earlier synod in Constantinople in 543 
condemn some of the teachings ascribed to that great Alexandrian. Justinian did not act as emphatically and consistently against the Monophysites as against other heretics. As we have seen, he sought to woo the more moderate of them, and Theodora, that is his, his, his wife, her known advocacy of their views may have softened his rigor towards them. In his last years, he attempted to force on the church a form of monophysitism known as, boy, this is some kind of word here, aphthartosdocetism. That's A-P-H-T-H-A-R-T-O-D-O-C-E-T-I-S-M. This held that Christ's body, being divine, had undergone no change from the time of its conception in the womb of Mary, and was incorruptible, incapable of suffering, or of the natural and blameless passions. It thus distinctly limited Christ's humanity. Justinian tried to impose this view on the bishops of the Catholic Church, and since the Orthodox among them resisted, he was preparing to apply physical violence when death removed him. Not only did monophysitism continue, it also spread. Its most active missionary was a younger contemporary of Justinian, Jacob Baradeus, born about 490, of well-to-do parents, Jacob was given a good education and had fluent use of Greek, Arabic, and Syriac. From his early youth, he was committed to the ascetic life. During an episcopate of nearly a generation, from 542 to 578, he roved from Nisibis in Mesopotamia to Alexandria in Egypt, usually on foot and garbed only in a ragged horse cloth, and is said to have consecrated two patriarchs, 89 bishops, and 100,000 priests. He extended monophysitism, strengthened it, and did something towards giving it a sense of unity. The term Jacobite or Jacobite applied to a large wing of the monophysites either perpetuates his memory or was intended to indicate the claim of the group to be the true church, the custodians of the faith of James or Jacob, the brother of Jesus. In spite of the labors of Jacob Baradeus, the Monophysites were badly divided. They differed from one another in doctrine and had no comprehensive organization. Towards the end of the 6th century, there were said to be 20 Monophysite sects in Egypt alone. One form was Tritheism, which held that in the Trinity there are really three gods, each with a substance and a nature different from the others. After the death of Justinian, there were attempts to unite the Monophysites. In 575, the Monophysites of Egypt chose a patriarch of Syrian origin, but he was not generally accepted. Not far from 580, about two years after the death of Jacob Baradeus, partly through the efforts of an Arab Christian prince, a council was held, which seemed for a brief time to have brought a semblance of accord, yet that also failed. The two leading monophysite sees were the patriarchates of Antioch and Alexandria. In Alexandria, there was also an Orthodox patriarch, but loyalty to him was confined chiefly to Greek residents and imperial functionaries. In spite of the use of force to obtain conformity with the Catholic faith, most of the Egyptians adhered to monophysitism in one or another of its expressions. Justinian was not content with seeking the doctrinal unity of his realm. He also enacted a large number of laws which dealt with various aspects of the life of the church, the election of bishops, the appointment of the heads of monasteries, the ordination of clergy, public worship, the management of church property, and the morals of the clergy, legislation which, by forbidding simony, the sale and purchase of ecclesiastical office, and the attendance of the clergy at the theater, and horse races is an indication that some of the clergy were given to these practices. Justinian increased the functions of bishops in the administration of civic and social matters, such as the overseeing of public works, the enforcement of legislation against gambling, and the rearing of exposed infants. In some matters, they acted in place of the governors. It will be seen that Justinian greatly accelerated a movement which had begun with Constantine for the domination of the church by the emperor and which made the church an instrument of the state. This control of the church by the emperor, known as Caesaropapism, 
was so characteristic of the eastern continuation of the Roman Empire that it was also called Byzantinism. As we have suggested earlier, it was the continuation of the tradition of the pre-Constantinian Roman Empire, by which the emperor, among other titles, bore that of Pontifex Maximus, or chief priest. It's not surprising that under Justinian, with the renewed vigor displayed by the Roman Empire, Christianity continued to spread in it in the outlying sections and on the borders of the realm. The reconquest of North Africa was followed not only by the strengthening of the Catholic Church against the Arians and Donatists, who flourished in that region under the Vandals, it also led to the conversion of some of the pagan Berbers, a process which continued after the death of Justinian. During the reign of Justinian, Christian, Christianity was carried further up the valley of the Nile into Nubia in both its Catholic and Monophysite forms. Through the encouragement and initiative of Justinian, at least one people in the Caucasus and a barbarian folk who crossed the Danube into the Roman territory adopted the Christian faith. Next time, the final stages of the Christological controversy something called monothelitism. Put in a link to uh, how God used Rome, principally the greatest of all the Caesars, Augustus, how God used Rome in preparing the world for Christianity. See you soon.